GM listeners, as, as Nico likes to say, my best Nico impression there. Uh, unfortunately, Nico and Phil are out this week, so it's just myself, uh, Devin Becker, and then our fantastic guest today, uh, Chandler Tomlinson, founder and CEO of World Spark Studios, uh, which you may know for their upcoming Spark Ball game. Um, but if you want to just uh, tell everyone yeah. about yourself a little bit, Chandler. Yeah. So Chandler, founder and CEO of World Spark Studios, we're making the game Spark Ball, just like Devin said. Um, we've been at it for several years now and are finally coming up on our first ever early access weekend. So super, super pumped uh, to talk more about everything we have going on. Really happy to be here. Sweet. Why don't you just tell everyone a little bit about Sparkadia and Sparkball, just for some background, especially yeah. for people who may not be familiar. Yeah. So I think the number one confusion that always happens with us is like, we hear about Sparkball and then we go to your Twitter and it says Sparkadia, like what, what is what? Um, so for reference, Sparkadia is what we describe as our universe. It's the universe that Sparkball ta- takes place in. And I think the reason we did that is because we want to be an IP focused company, not just a game studio. Um, we see the power of like Witcher and Cyberpunk and even Arcane uh, coming from the from Riot's universe. And we said, that's what we want to be. We don't want to just be a single game. So Sparkadia is our universe and um, i Always happy to talk more about that anytime because I think our the world and the universe and the characters we're building are so good. Um, but the biggest thing that, that people know us for right now is Sparkball. And Sparkball is what we describe as League of Legends meets Rocket League. Um, and it sounds a little weird at first, but basically instead of lanes and minions and you know fighting over objectives uh, or towers and, and nexuses, you're fighting over a ball and you're ultimately trying to score a ball in a goal. So we don't have any minions. Uh, it's all fighting over that ball. And so it's really the juxtaposition of am I fighting right now or am I playing with the ball right now? And how can I do both of those simultaneously? And if I take my eyes off the ball for 10 seconds, did the other team score because I chased that kill and it's balancing those things. And I think that's what makes spark ball so fun for sure. So like when I, when I've looked at the game, there's a, a number of different potential influences that or other games, at least that made me think of besides just a uh, rocket yeah. league, league of legends. So I'm kind of curious, like your thoughts on these other potential influences or relationships. The first one that that's obvious. And we've spoken about this before in person is Omega strikers, mostly because like, that's also very recent and also tries to go for like a kind of a similar uh, style, like kind of the anime style. Um, and then uh, there's the other kind of big one on mobile, which is like brawl stars, brawl ball mode, which has yep. like a lot of similarities, but it's much, much lighter on the MOBA aspect. And then even other, ones like battle right which were just kind of focused more on the battle part uh and then going back even further i was a big fan of like mega man soccer back on like snes and then there's the mario striker series you know the ones where you're just kind of like it's a little more super powered soccer stuff like that um like how do all those kind of compare or, or maybe influences on the game yeah it's a great question um i'll start with the kind of omega strikers reference because as soon as that came out we were like yo this is really well done <laughs> Uh, and oddly similar. Uh oh, are, are we in trouble here? Um, because it's super well done, um, and I really love those guys. But the way that I describe it is, Omega Strikers is a ball game that happens to have combat. And I would say that Mario Strikers is kind of the same way. Omega Strikers takes combat a little farther, but a ball game with combat. We are a combat game that happens to have a ball. Um, and I think that complete shift actually, it doesn't sound super big, but it actually changes the complete dynamic of the game because um, our characters have a full set of abilities. Um, like you're, in a way, you're winning the game by scoring the ball, but the best way to score the ball is to kill everybody. Um, so that's it's much more combat focused. Um, and Omega Strikers, you know, your abilities may have long cooldowns and you're barely punching people and it's mostly about the movement of the ball. So I think that's where we differ the most. Um, the two primary inspirations are one, 100% battle, right? Um, for anybody who played battle, right back in the day, like I remember the first time I played battle, right? I was like, Oh my gosh, this is one of the best games I have ever played in my life. This is so fun, incredibly polished combat. And then a week later I was like, okay, I'm really bored. Like, is that (laughs) all this game has to offer? Like, this was incredible the first time I played it. And so what really came to mind was how do we solve that? How do we take that good of combat and wrap objectives around it. And I don't think adding minions and towers and stuff to it was the right solution. We wanted to find something else. Uh, And then if you go really, really far back, there's a game called Star Wars The Old Republic for any of the old super MMO nerds. Um, And they had a game mode called Hutball. And anyone who played Star Wars The Old Republic will remember Hutball because it had the most legendary voiceovers (laughs) <laughs> I've ever heard in my life. I hear that in my dreams. Um, and so it was essentially what we're doing, but in MMO format. Um, and it was just incredible, incredible fun. So we said, what if we combine Battle Right with Hutball? 
Um, and I think it works. It took us a really, really long time to figure out. Uh, oh my gosh, it took a lot of iterations uh, to figure out, but I, I think we figured it out and, and it works. It just really works. I think it's interesting that the the angle you took in the comparison to Omega Strikers, mostly because I find uh, any game that has a that where you can kill each other that has an objective that's not killing each other, people still focus on the killing yeah. each other part, right? Because that's that's the most visceral part. That's like the the part that's kind of the most fun, and a lot of times the objective kind of falls by the wayside. Whether that be like in a first person shooter game where it's like capture the flag or something, and people are just like capture the flag. I'm capturing the frag. <laughs> like yep. I don't care about the I flag like right now, uh, yeah. and so. I wonder, like, do you end up in situations, though, where people just don't even care about the ball anymore? Yes, 100%. And that's kind of what I'm talking about when I say it was really, really hard and took a lot of iterations to figure out. Um, we still have the problem. Like, we, we generally tell everybody when they first come in to play spark ball, their, their very first game, we say, look, your brain is going to be torn between two things. One is chasing kills, which most people will lean toward. And the second is the ball. And we say that your first game, only focus on one of those. Because you're not going to be able to mechanically do both. No, no one can. Um, and it's not until game two, three that you start picking up the ball. But I think what happens is when you see a game of spark ball played at a high level and you see the fancy stuff that you can do with the ball. And ball carrying is not, we're not knockout city, for example, where it's 8 million different controls of how you do the ball. But the interceptions and the defense and the jukes with shooting, all of a sudden you're like, okay, now the ball is really, really interesting. And I think... Our metric of success here, which is completely intangible and just a pat on the back more so than anything, <laughs> um, we have players that will do absolutely nothing but chase kills in our game. But we also have players who are absolutely not remotely mechanically good, and so all they do is focus on the ball. And we see both of those players have success in the same game. And on top of that, we see games where you'll be down in one round 15 to 5 in kills, and the team with 5 kills will win the round. And I think seeing that happen really makes us feel like, okay, we've kind of found both. Um, because I totally agree. It's natural instinct. I'm the same way. I'm I'm going to chase kills if it's around. And you have to kind of slap yourself mid-fight to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa don't chase this. Don't chase this. Go. <laughs> right. Go back. It right. makes me think of like uh, at CSGO or something, right, where the objective is to plant the bomb. How often that actually <laughs> happens can yep. be very, you know, it's it, killing everyone just is like the superior objective if you could pull it off. If not, you could be sneaky. Um but if I remember correctly, did I see that there is like actually benefit to holding the ball, meaning like some like big bonuses or abilities you get that that seems a little different. Yeah. So we just added what we call armbands. We, we're trying to like play off the, the soccer element here. Um, and essentially, whenever you're carrying the ball, your character actually gets a buff. Uh, do you deal more damage or you heal while you're carrying the ball? And then we also made it where passing the ball between teammates gives you buffs. So, for example, you get a move speed buff and a shield. And so, um, like, just for reference, we had a play today where one team was getting smashed, but then all of a sudden they all respawned, and they did, like, this magical tiki taka style like, pass back and forth, completely ran circles around us and scored because they were just moving faster than us because they kept possession of the ball. And it was beautiful to watch. Like I'm, I'm on the opposite team and I'm like, I'm not mad in the slightest watching this. That was, that was beautiful. I'm so glad I got scored on right here. So yeah, there's definitely advantages to what I would describe as possession. And I think that's what we struggled so long to figure out was in a ball game, especially think rocket league, the ball can go from one goal to the other in half a second. Essentially, right. And so any game that you can punt the ball, essentially, that happens. And so we had to find a way to add structure to the game. It's how do we kind of draw these battle lines? Think of it like a payload or a line of scrimmage. How do we draw those and enforce like, hey, don't just get the ball and take off running. Get the ball, take stock of where you are, look where your teammates are, what do you want to do next? And that was really hard to balance, but I, you're totally right on kind of how you have to figure those things out. That's interesting because, like, uh, I think of like Brawl Ball, for example, um, in in Brawl Stars, and possessing the ball could be a detriment because you can't fight back, and so there's times where you'll pass it to the enemy just to disable them to be able to shoot them, <laughs> things like that. Like, there's this the strategy around holding the ball or not holding the ball, like, becomes kind of an interesting dynamic. Although, if in this game, it's there's actually like 
straight up advantage for holding the ball in the sense of like, obviously you're, you have possession, but you're also uh, able to use that to your advantage in some way. That's, I mean, that's interesting, but then I, I wonder like, so do you have actual positions in the game? Cause like Omega Strikers has the deal with like, you have the goalie and I, I constantly see the dynamic people, <laughs> just the goalie out. pissed <laughs> off at everyone else uh, because they're, they're in the goal area or the goalie is out of the goal and not doing his job like that, that dynamic. I even see that in Rocket League where, where no one will play back and then there's no one then to defend the goal. Is there positions? Is there a goalie? So I would say instead of positions, we have roles. Um, and you can kind of look at this something like Overwatch, like tank DPS healer. Um, and it's very, very fluid. Um, we tried really hard um, to enforce what I would call positions of like, hey, we want the tank person to be constantly carrying the ball. And then we found out that that feels absolutely terrible. Um, and to your point, you're totally right. We used to completely change the abilities when you were carrying the ball and people would throw the ball at the other person so that they couldn't fight back. Like, it, it happened all the time. So we ended up shifting more into roles. Um, there's obviously the idea that, like, look, if I'm a range character, I'm not going to be diving toward the goal and trying to score from there. But it it really works out really nicely. What you find is that range characters are more often playing defense because they're just closer to the goal. If the ball turns over, they're already in the right position, and we always recommend everybody stay between the ball and the goal. And you can never really go wrong. So, yeah, I would say there's more roles than there are positions. And we've tried to enforce, like, the forwards and the midfielders and stuff. doesn't work. feels terrible. Um, so it's kind of like Rocket League. There's kind of always that person that, that is ready to go but but not required to be because I'm with you on Omega Strikers. I get bored. You're like that six-year-old kid sitting in the goal uh, right. playing soccer, picking their nose and like, all right, I'm just leaving. I'm, but I'm then there's some people who love it, though, right? Yeah. There's some people that are not like, stay out, of, stay out of my goal zone. <laughs> this is my area. I'm going to be here the whole yep. game. Just let me do my job. Like I see that dynamic a lot where there's just a lot of frustration between those two uh, over roles like that. I think the, the the main issue when you start thinking about like positions and things like that is, yes, there totally are people that like that thing. But what percentage of players is it compared to the, the, the higher population? Right. And I think what I notice in Omega Strikers is it's like I have an auto-filled goalie. Versus a person who absolutely loves playing goalie. Right. And the difference is so astronomical that it feels terrible. And I think, you know, like League and Dota kind of went through this iteration too, where it's like, or, or League, after seeing what happened to Dota, is like, how do we make support actually fun? Because otherwise it's it's so garbage. And um, for any people that like follow WoW, the Solo Shuffle came out and the healer cues are instant and DPS cues are an hour long because nobody wants to play healer in solo shuffle. And so you really don't want to, the, the problem with enforcing that kind of feel of positions and things like that is it's just population. You're, you're killing your matchmaking pool even more essentially. So then that brings up a big question, especially related to like what's, what's happened over time with overwatch, stuff like that. You get people that have characters they want to play, right? Uh, how are you doing either matchmaking or character selection in a way that lets people kind of, play the characters they want to play? Like, what's the strategy there in terms of that? Yeah, I think, you know, in an ideal world, our game is 4v4. I think in an ideal world, we look at it as tank support to DPS. Um, and obviously Overwatch switched to the five players and it's worked somewhat well, but it's like the healer pool is so small because there's eight healer champions and 27 DPS champions. So you kind of run into that same issue. I mean, for us right now, like we only have eight playable heroes, like inherently, like there's going to be imbalance and like we have people that naturally gravitate towards certain things. Um, so we don't really know how we're going to do like a roll queue in a way, or like, do you, do you have to queue up his tank or DPS? Um, and <clears throat> mainly it's just kind of a gentleman's agreement. Hey, nobody picked the same champion as the other person on your team. Um, when it comes to matchmaking, um, we obviously, this is obviously something we want to do. Sparkball works really well competitively. Um, I'll put it this way. Like we've been playing the game every single day for God knows how long. And, I have zero fun when it's a stomp one way or the other. And I think this is just inherent for any competitive game. So um, for early access weekend, we will have MMR, ELO, whatever. And we're trying to match people up with that because we find that, you know, even skill levels just, just makes the game better. But we don't necessarily have any magic bullet when it comes to like how, oh man, someone already picked the hero I want. Right. What do I do? It's like, God, there's eight heroes. There's not much we can really do right, right now, unfortunately. I mean, the thought I usually have, like, whenever I play these games, um, like, I just screw out and bap bap a lot lately, if you've heard of that one on, like, web browser one, but, like, I always feel like uh, it'll just kind of 
randomly put you on a character when you when you first start and it's like if i could just set like like my top three character preferences and if like someone else had that as the same one it would just pick my next one down and next one down and just like at least automatically give me some kind of preference and then we can always change if we wanted to something like that where you can set some kind of preference or have it like make it easier to just automatically be selecting your character and and try and uh balance that a little bit maybe even factor that in the matchmaking without like overly factoring it I, i don't know there's it seems like there could be a way to like maybe allow for a little bit more semi-automatic of getting towards your character without enforcing it. Yeah, I think what's super important to think about, um, it's it's a great idea and I totally agree. Um, I think what's important to think about is what is the next best option? Everybody has their favorite character. Right. Um, What happens when my favorite character gets taken from me? What is my next best best option? Um, I only like playing one healer in Overwatch, Moira. Every other healer, I'm like, I suck. I'm terrible at this. Don't pick Moira. Otherwise, I'm going to feed. And not like in a toxic way, just like inherently I'm just going to play bad. Um, And I think like that's inherently a problem of like, look, Overwatch has nine other healers and I just don't like any of them. So whenever I don't get Moira, I'm legitimately upset. Yeah. Um, Therefore, I probably shouldn't queue healer if that's my only option. So I think what we've been able to do with Sparkball is like every – hero has something just absolutely bizarre about them that you might latch on to. And so even now as someone who has 900 hours played in spark ball and has played every single one of these champions 8,000 times, I don't mind going to my next favorite character because the, the, it's not that transition doesn't feel super hard. I can find other fun things to do. So I think what's super important is like characters feel unique, but also familiar enough that I'm not completely out of bounds trying to play this character. Is there like a different concept of different builds or anything so that could be different play styles for them? Yeah, of course. And I think so much of that, um, you know, we have items and you can obviously build, you know, tank DPS or or, or both. Um, But I think what's more important than kind of builds is how you play the game. Um, In one game, I may be playing a tank and I may just be like, hey, look, I'm going to ignore everybody and just play the ball this whole game because that's what I like doing with this character. Um, In another game, I'm like, hey, I'm a tank and I'm just going to get in everybody's way and deal damage. So I think that's that's more important is that you can play every character different way. And perhaps the reason I like Moira so much is because I can play DPS Moira and piss everybody off. Um, And you can do the same thing in Sparkball and still be successful. So I think that's, that's super, super important for kind of that variety of like, I played this character a million times, but I'm going to do it differently this time. Uh, Right. Figuring that out. And what about progression during the match? Is there uh, like, obviously a MOBA generally has the in-app, uh, in, in match progression and that's a big part of what makes it sort of like a micro RPG are you guys doing some kind of progression system or yeah we are so you level up in game but there's not like individual levels um, like a League of Legends it's kind of more like hot style almost um, but we don't really have a ton of like you're not farming minions so having something like right. individual experience makes no sense so we have items um, and then our game is best of three rounds so your character progressively gets stronger over rounds and you get kills and you get gold and things like this and, and can buy items um, what we don't have in that we will have in eventually is what we call augments which is just talents from Heroes of the Storm um, and I think anybody that was a HOTS player like love or hate HOTS like the talents were fun like it's it's really interesting on how you can build a, di- a character completely differently so we'll eventually have those in um and i think that's really going to change that that in match progression of hey i was I, I think when it comes to depth and progression the most important thing is that you feel like you can make strategic choices once the game starts and i think what makes league of legends you know probably the most deep game of all time um like from a competitive standpoint or, or dota is As you see team comps developing and as you see their movements on the map developing, you're like, I need to play this way. I need to build this item instead. And uh, I think the augments and the items really help us push that direction for sure. So there is like an ability like mid-match essentially to start, say, countering the other team by adjusting your build or play style. Absolutely. All right, cool. Um, the, the big question that comes up with all this kind of style of play, and I kind of alluded to her earlier, is toxicity and teamwork, right? Any game, but just basically the, the golden rule is if your game, like, encourages or requires teamwork, there will be yeah. toxicity, right? So, like, how are you guys trying to address that? I, I know you have someone from former Riot, and that's, like, always been a big uh, issue with that, you know, that they've tried to tackle. 
Yeah, like, look, I, I, I uh, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about, and I'm not going to sit here and claim that, like, we've solved it by any stretch. I don't think anyone's going to solve it, solve it. Um, in my opinion, and granted, this could be just, like, the boomer in me talking, um, like, what the hell happened with people playing video games? Like, this is not what it used to be like. Um, like I, I remember growing up on Unreal Tournament and World of Warcraft, and, like, everybody was learning, and we were just, like, growing up together, and now everybody's just a giant jerk. Um, so that's obviously something we want to fight. That's not what video games are supposed to be. Like you got into video games where like you, you love them. You want to bond with people over them. Um, and so when we talk about toxicity, there's a few things that we think about. Um, League of Legends is a long game, 30 to 40 minutes. You are committing a large chunk of your time. And when a teammate screws that up for you, it sucks. It really, really sucks. Um, so the first thing we do is like, we have shorter game times. It's 10 to 15 minute games. If you have a feeder on your team, cool. You're in and out in 10 minutes. You're on to the next one. It doesn't sting as bad. Um, the second thing is, is like, even when someone is feeding in spark ball, they can still be incredibly useful. Uh, I've seen Owen 10 players in our game score the game winning goal. And you're like, Oh, thank God they were still playing and trying really hard. So you can be horribly underpowered and still succeed. You can't really do that in a, in a league of legends or, or a Dota match. And then the final piece is just, in my opinion, game feel. Um, and this is kind of, you know, magic, intangible, fairy dust. But I always talk about this in terms of Super Smash Brothers. Smash is an incredibly competitive game. Uh, everybody rages in it. But for how competitive it is, you laugh more than you rage when playing Super Smash Brothers. And I think the best example I can give of this is Falcon Punch. Your first instinct when you get Falcon Punched off the ledge is like, ah, and then you're like, it's kind of funny because it's a Falcon Punch and you're just like laughing that it's that it's a Falcon Punch. So I really firmly believe that when we talk about like our characters and our world design, that there's a completely different feel to getting, you know, Yasuo dove and chopped in half by a hyper carry versus I died because I got run over by a food truck. Like there's a completely different feeling to dying on those two things. And um, we essentially we always our long-term vision with Sparkball is what we describe as we want players to finish our games happier than when they started our games. And I think something pretty universal about League of Legends is I don't think anyone's ever played four hours of League of Legends and walked away happier than when they started. Like, you just walk away salty and unhappy. Uh, you just don't feel good inside. And Even I, when you win, you're like, exactly. I, I, I carried the whole team. Exactly. You know, like. And for the record, this is coming from someone who has played 15 years and countless hours of I love the game. It's just kind of the inherent piece of it. So I think so much of what we're trying to do is build characters around that feel where, you know, you're in and out, but more importantly, like, you're just laughing the whole time. It's like you have that one play, that one crazy interception. And like I said, in, in earlier today, we got scored on and I was like, that was awesome. <laughs> like, that was incredible to watch. I'm so happy that I got to see that. So I think that's so much of what we're trying to push on the toxicity front. Um, and hopefully that works. I don't, uh, clearly the whole tribunal and judgment and banning people doesn't work. It yeah. clearly does not work. Um, so how do we kind of rewrite it from the ground up? And I hope I hope we're right. I really, really hope we're right. Then how are you guys looking at uh, in-match communication, meaning like, say, emotes or voice chat or text chat or and cross-team communication or not, like that kind of stuff? Yeah, so we do have in-game voice chat, um, just like uh, Valorant. Like, you pop in, you can mute anybody at any time. We also have a ping system, kind of like Apex, like you just middle mouse button, you can click to, to communicate pass. Um, it is an inherently teamwork heavy game. Like, you're not going to have a passing the ball game that's not inherently teamwork. So... You know, I think the, the biggest thing we can do, uh, we do a little te allow text chat, TBD on if that stays in. Um, I, I don't know. Um, but I think the biggest thing you can do is like in game design, any system that can be abused will be abused. That's just like a general rule of thumb. And so text chat, voice chat, whatever, it's going to have bad apples. But how can you do your best to make it a positive experience going into the game? And I think that's really where that whole game time fresh start fun characters, you're having fun. Like, can you go in with the right mindset? Five minutes into the game, okay, it's probably out of our hands. There's probably not much else we can do, but can we get people to at least go into the mindset versus, hey, I'm chain queuing in League of Legends and I'm already mad from the moment the game starts. That is something we have to uh, 
try to avoid, obviously. Is there some pre-match communication then to like yeah. coordinate, hey, you play this, I'll play that sort of thing? Yeah, there is. I mean, not not so much for early access, but that's definitely something we want to do. Um, and I think like role queue is obviously very, very helpful for that so it doesn't swap. And frankly, like I think League of Legends has done a much better job with this where they will allow you to swap champions and things like that. So I think they've you know kind of paved the way for us. Um, so I really just think it all goes back to what's your mindset when you're, when you're first in that. So then, uh, I guess the next question after that is, uh, pick and ban style stuff, or at least counter picking where you could see what the enemy team's picking. Like what is, what does all that look like now? And then where are you trying to go with it? Yeah. And now it it doesn't exist. Um, but I I think eventually, like, again, I think league is doing this just fine. Um, you know, the, the kind of swap and ban, I think the big thing we want to be able to do is speed it up. Um, played Valorant for the first time in a long time the other day and it spent like eight minutes between games and I, I'm bored out of my mind all tabbing watching videos while I'm waiting for a game to load so I think we really want to speed up those phases and I think the other thing that we want to do and this is kind of unrelated to your question but is allow you to pick pick and ban things more than just your heroes um, because I think there's so much strategic depth I mean people in League and Dota spend hours talking about drafts and things like that there's so much strategic depth you can add on that um, and we want to be able to emulate that and allow you to pick things like environmental effects. Um, like, does this part of the map change based on something I picked or banned? Uh, my goalie. We have an AI goalie right now. How amazing would it be if you could also pick your team's AI goalie and there that alters the way that you play? Um, so that's definitely something we want to dive into on pick and ban um, and kind of feel like the main reason for that is because it's actually encouraging teamwork before the game even starts. Right. It's this idea of like, hey, all four of us now get to vote in a way, on something, we're already coming together. We're already a team. We, we made a decision together, um, or we didn't. Um, and, and building that chemistry, I guess, uh, immediately before the game, I think that's super key. Yeah, definitely, definitely tricky to do. Like like you said, without slowing things down, you want to allow yeah. for that communication. Uh, one thing I've noticed about like uh, pick a band kind of stuff is that uh, when you're maybe not as knowledgeable about the game or there's a lot of different heroes, you end up in a situation where a lot of people might not know how to choose correctly, right? So I, I've I've noticed, like, so, for example, I was playing uh, Mobile Legends Bang Bang, right? And the way that works is once you hit a certain rank, pick and ban's enabled. And I still found myself, like, this: the hero pool's way too deep for me yeah. to know, and it would, like, ask me, like, you know, it, <laughs> it would alternate, <gasps> sorry, who gets to pick and ban? And then when I would become my turn, I'd be like, I don't know who I find the most annoying <laughs> on the other team that hasn't already been banned. Right. And then you have like the idea of like, Oh, you banned someone that your teammate wanted to play because you didn't know who to ban. Like even in like, I re- ran into that train to play power league in brawl stars, right. Where I'm like, uh, I know this game pretty, pretty well, uh, cause I've been playing since beta, but I don't know like the competitive meta yeah. counters. Right. So I don't, you know, or the, or the, the current team comps everyone's playing. So you're in a situation where like, should I even be in this situation? Like, am, am I, am I uh, capable of voting? <laughs> you <laughs> know, my vote be my taken brain? away or not? Here? Right. Like, should I have a vote because I yeah. don't have the requisite knowledge to vote? Yeah. And I always find that kind of like an interesting, like, obviously you can have like casual versus ranked and like power league is an example of that because that's its own separate, you know, competitive mode in there. And so, you know, that there's going to be there going into that. Uh, like how are you thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if League still does this, but they used to have where, like, you had to hit level 30 before you could actually enter, like, a, a draft mode. And I think that's totally legitimate. I think just to solve, like, uh, some of your media problems would be something like a suggest system of, like, hey, you guys can suggest a ban here or suggest what champion I should pick here based on, on meta. Or, like, hey, I, I, you know, I'm able to put some icons on my name that says these are the type of heroes I like to play. You can recommend me someone who might fit in our team comp or something like that. I think that's, like, the, the initial thing. Um, but I think like inherently, and I have absolutely zero solution to this. You have to think about games like MLB and league. Um, this game has been out for 15 years. I think league is currently up to like 190 champions. They had like 30 when I first started playing. Um, what is riot supposed to do about that? (laughs) Like they're not going to delete champions and they're not going to stop releasing new ones. So like inherently, like, has it just run its course? Like, what are you supposed to do? Like, if you, how does League bring in new players right now when it has 190 champions? That that ceiling is insanely high. And I think the only advantage we have over that is, and Lord, I, I dream of a day where we have 190 heroes in the game. We, we've, we've made it, if that happens. Um, but I think inherently, like, the problem with League is, like, it requires knowledge to play League of Legends well. I'm not just talking about, like, map 
objective knowledge. I'm also talking about hero knowledge. I need to know what this character does to play successfully against it. I think because our combat, I don't want to say it's more dumbed down. It's, it's just more mechanically intensive rather than knowledge intensive. Um, so I think inherently our knowledge barrier to entry is significantly lower than the kind of a full on MOBA. And so it like, what doesn't matter what character you pick. It doesn't matter what enemy character, the enemy picks. There's going to be one or two things that maybe you really, really want to know, but the rest is like, look, throw the ball. Like you can still get 50% of this game down, regardless if you know what anybody does. Um, and I think that's the key because I talk so much about, um, Dota right now, if it came out six months ago, it would fail immediately. I, I, I'm very, very <laughs> confident about that fact. It Dota cannot onboard new players anymore. It's screwed. It knows right. its niche and it's That's dope. That's why I don't play it. Yeah, I, it. I don't want to read the Wikipedia for exactly. like it's just to start, right? Exactly. Um, and it knows its niche and it's done it really well and props to anybody who still plays Dota. It, it is insane. But you're never going to bring on new players. That game will just slowly trickle players until it dies out. Um, and... That's really cool, but I just don't know if like today's audiences want that anymore. Uh, we all have short attention spans. I download, I buy a Steam game and I play it for thirty minutes, and that shit's getting refunded if I don't like it within those thirty minutes. And you, there's no way in hell you're gonna like Dota the first thirty minutes you play it if you've never played it before. There's yeah, no fair way. point. And I would argue the same thing about League of Legends. And so, so much of what we're trying to do with Sparkball is like, how do you make someone? like their first 30 minutes of spark ball. And I think so much of what we enjoy hearing people coming out of is the quote, I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, but I really enjoyed doing it. And that's like the dream for us to hear because it's like, yeah, no one knows in a competitive game what you're doing the first 30 minutes, Yeah, but can they still enjoy that learning experience? And I think we've pulled it off just due inherently to the game type. I'm not going to sit here and say we're geniuses, but we got lucky with the genre and it happens to fit that really well. And one area around that that I've noticed uh, with the, the the relaunch of Omega Strikers that people run into is, especially as they're adding new characters, um, having some sort of practice mode or something where you could try out a new character seems pretty important to these kind of games. Like if you don't have that, what ha- what happens is you have people essentially throwing without meaning to throw because they want to try out yeah. a new character. That always becomes a bit of a problem, right? Where like you're trying out a new character and, and you're kind of screwed. Like one way I found that, that Brawl Stars is... It, inadvertently kind of doing that is each character has its own individual like level, right? Like the, the trophy level yeah. for the character. And so what happens is that's factored into matchmaking. So when you've unlocked a brand new character that you haven't played very much, you're going to get mostly put with other newbies for their character, whether they're newbies to the game entirely or to that character, like that allows for a little bit like of, of balancing that. So you're not throwing as much. Everyone's kind of throwing that much. <laughs> basically. Is anybody throwing if everybody's throwing? Yeah, right. Yeah, like but, but it's, like a, it's a little more comfortable to, sure. to feel less like you're letting your team down. Yeah. I think HOTS had an interesting solution to this that I absolutely hated for the record. Uh, but I just it's worth mentioning is that they required your champion level out of game to be like level five before you were able to queue it in a ranked game. But I think what really sucks about this is like, I don't play competitive games to play freaking normal mode. I play it so I can, you know, circle jerk about my ELO and feel good about myself or feel terrible about myself and try to push it up more and more and more. So I found myself as like, I have, you know, eight characters at level five, rather than go level up more characters to level five, I would much rather just play ranked mode because I don't enjoy normal games. So I don't really think that's necessarily a solution. Um, I think inherently, like, there's no great solution to this um, other than a really good practice mode. We have a playground mode. You can run around and kill dummies. Um, But I think what I will say is something that Battlerite did insanely well um, is their combat felt so good that I have found myself losing time in playground mode, just running around and attacking stuff. Um, and I feel really good because I find myself doing the same thing in our game. Um, and what that means is that I don't need to go into a full match to experience and figure out the spells of a character. I can go into practice mode, find out what everything does do a bunch of, you know, I have no cooldowns on so I can find all the cool combos, find all the cool techs, and now the first game I know exactly what this hero does. And in that practice mode, I can immediately switch. Um, Something in League of Legends that I think is baffling, and I guess you just have to blame Spaghetti Code, is you can go into practice mode, but you can't switch champions in practice mode. And I'll be damned if I'm going to sit there Go through champion select for 30 seconds, sit through a load screen, start at level one, and then walk out and then be like, okay, I'd like to try another champion now. Right. Uh, 
Absolutely not. So the ability to just get in, switch champions quickly and test those things out and have fun hitting dummies. Yeah. Like if you're having fun hitting dummies, you've you have a good combat system. Uh, and, and I do. I love hitting dummies. It definitely seems like uh, street fighting kind of games tend to have really good modes for exactly. that, right? Like the lab kind of modes. Example. Like recent example of being like multiverses, like was the most recent one I'd played that had like a really, you could configure a lot. You could swap characters. You could, you know, like it was nice that you could, could kind of configure what the enemy does. So you have a situation where you can kind of practice against different things. Uh, I think for people that are like, I want to get really good at this game before I go embarrass myself in a ranked match <laughs> or or lose ELO because I'm playing with a new character, uh, that kind of stuff, I think, is usually... I mean, obviously, a fighting game is a little bit different genre in the way people play and the way it's like 1v1 potentially and stuff like that, but it seems like that kind of mode... But but it's it's rare that I see a game launch with that being very well fleshed out. That, that always feels like a well, we need to get everything else working. <laughs> and don't worry, it's coming, and then that'll get kicked down the can like a year into the launch. Yeah, definitely not for us. Um, Playground was one of the first things we worked on, just because it's super important for our own sanity to, to test characters. And I think something we haven't talked about at all. I don't even know if we've mentioned it at all. Is Sparkball is WASD. It's not click to move, so it's inherently like a much more mechanical game. And so you talk about you know in the lab. Um, that actually helps in Spark Ball. Like in League of Legends, when I'm just clicking around, you know, killing bots, mindless bots and minions, it's like, wow, I'm clicking and slowly pushing buttons. Yeah. Uh, it feels so good. Um, this is not representative at all. Whereas in a lab with WASD, you know, I'm I'm moving super quick. I'm dashing through things and starting to get the feel for, for all the timings. So I think it's just inherently kind of a, a different genre, a different control scheme. Uh, but I totally agree with you that that, that lab piece is so important. Uh, for sure. So then uh, you brought WASD mouse and all that. So like, obviously platform is intended for PC. Yeah. Uh, I mean, are you guys, uh, in terms of, uh, are you looking at other multi-platform? Are you looking at even like Mac support? Uh, what storefronts? All that sort of thing. Yeah, so we're on Steam right now. Obviously, we don't know how long that's going to last in Web3. I mean, we, we all know kind of how it works. Um, we'll be available through Epic probably as well. Um, I think our game inherently works super well on mobile. We haven't tried it, but I'm just assuming uh, because, you know, Brawl Stars, ball mode, a uh, little similar. Um, but WSD controls work really well on mobile. Like, it's just kind of a fact. So I think when you look at, like, how long it took Riot to pour League into Wild Rift, it's because they had to change basically the entire game to make it work. Um, we don't have that same problem. It's pretty much a one-to-one -one comparison. We don't have so many spells that controls are going to be super complicated. It's It's a very simple control scheme. Um, that just has a lot of depth in the mechanics. So yeah, we definitely want to port to mobile. Um, we'll have Mac support eventually. Um, it just is a gigantic pain in the ass, obviously, to package and deploy and make sure stuff works on PC and Mac. Like, that is not even remotely on the radar. So yeah, for early access, have a PC. That's the solution for now. But but we definitely have plans to to, to do mobile as well, for sure. Are you guys in, uh, considering like Epic Game Store for the Web3 support if, if Steam's yeah. just going to not be good? Yeah, we're already approved and ready to be listed on Epic. Um, it's just splitting your audience right now is just super right. dangerous for obvious reasons. So, I, I do wonder, though, if it's like um, a situation where if Epic becomes, becomes more well-known for having the Web3 stuff, then that, that's where people go to look, mm -hmm. right? They're like, hey, I like Web3 games. I'm going to go look here. Like uh, Grit just came out yesterday, for example. So oh, you have another yeah. Yeah. like a uh, big Web3 game. Like it's, it's you know, a double A uh, to triple A kind of quality game. But, you know, it's another one that's Web3, right? That has support uh, in the client. Yeah, I mean, you're going to go where users are. <laughs> like it's not, I'm not a right. publisher. I have no clue about like the individual metrics and how to track all this. Um if Epic starts to take the lead, we're not going to be tastemakers. I think that's like the most important thing to realize. And I think that's what all Web3 games should realize. None of us have the power to make the Epic Game Store good. Like none of us have that kind of, you know, audience pull with it. Maybe we will eventually. Um, but right now it's just like Steam discoverability is just through the roof. Everybody in the world has Steam. Uh, and even for early access, it's like, hey, here's a Steam key. And everyone's like, cool, done. We're good. Um, so I think that's super important. Just there's enough hurdles to get people uh, into Web3 right. games. We don't have any Web3 integration anyway, so we don't have a hurdle there. But I would say the hurdle to start a new game is already insane, uh, especially right. in today's landscape. There's so many games. I don't want to commit my time and my mind share to learning a new game. That takes a, That's a very big step for me. 
Um, and so you got to make everything else as easy as possible because as soon as you tell me, hey, it's going to take you 20 minutes to download this game, I'm like, okay, well, forget it then. I don't really care. I care that much uh, to do that, so might as well go this direction. And then obvious question, right? Free to play or? 100% free to play, yeah. Cool. Uh, so then that leads to the uh, the nitty gritty of the fun stuff that I like to talk about all the time, uh, the economic side and the Web3 side. So uh, if it's free to play, first off, then where are you making the money, right? Yeah. So uh, it's not super nitty gritty for us and it's probably not very fun for you <laughs> on our side um, because we are notoriously like anybody that's ever listened to us talk on any space or AMA ever knows that we are like the most web two game imaginable while still being a web three game. Like we are very, very adamantly that, um, we follow a pretty simple free to play model. It's league of legends, but five to 10% of the cosmetics are NFTs. It's, it's really that simple. Um, I think inherently, and, and this is something that I think is crucially important is a MOBA is an absolutely terrible web three game. Like, how much can you really do with NFTs or tokens or any of that sort of thing in a super hyper-competitive short session game? (laughs) It's just not going to – there's not a lot you can do. And so what we look at it is this is really where the Sparkadia angle comes in for us. We want to build an ecosystem uh, that uses Sparkball as a community builder. And then starts pulling it in. So when we talk about things like mass adoption and bringing in, I'm not going to throw out the billion gamers cheese uh, here. But when we talk <laughs> about the mass adoption and traditional gamers, um, they're not, in my opinion, going to come in and play a Web3 heavy game. No matter how light the barriers are, it doesn't matter. They want to play a game. And so what we want to do is make people fall in love with Sparkball and get them falling in love, more importantly, with Sparkadia not just Sparkball. And I think League does this so well. As soon as you see a character that you play in League, you're like, oh my God, this is so cool. And it's it's akin to the fact that in in WoW, when you used to see like Thrall and Jaina walking around, like that feeling feels so cool uh, to see those things. So ultimately we want to build an ecosystem of Sparkadia, Metaverse, if that's what you want to call it. I don't care. Um, We want to build that. And then as we start getting into more and more games, uh, the second game will be super pay to win. Not like, pay to win, pay to win, but like a more, I can pay, you know, gotcha style or something like that. I can pay to progress. Uh, but it'll be a genre where that's okay. Like it's not a big deal. And so that's how we want to lean in those web three elements. Maybe it's something where I play spark ball with my friends cause it's super fun. But during the day I play the more web three focused gotcha game. Um, and I think finding those synergies that can work together, I don't think you can solve all of web three's problems in a single game. Uh, I just don't think it's possible. Right. So if, if it's just like uh, some light cosmetics uh, in there, the question obviously is like, why, why even do Web3? You're like, why, what's your guys' strategy there? Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty open and honest about that. Maybe I shouldn't say this on a podcast, but like it money. Um, we shopped, uh, the game was called Circuits and Shields way back in the day, um, and then Eden Brawl. And we shopped it around and we took it to all the gaming BCs and they were like, this is a really, really good prototype. Like how you did this for the amount of money you did this is incredible. And then I was like, great, like, let's talk terms. Let's figure this out. Cause it was, I was self-funding it all at the time. Um, and they're like, Oh no, 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 no. We like the game, but this is not investable. Sorry, because who the hell are you Chandler? I don't come from gaming. I don't have the riot background. That's, that's not me. And it was just my first rodeo. Um, Talk to some people and they're like, hey, I think you could do some really cool Web3 stuff with this. Think about like World of Warcraft and the ecosystem plan. I was like, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. And then we raised $3 million in like two weeks. <laughs> and it was it was literally like that night and day uh, on it. But that said, I still actually truly do believe kind of in that World of Warcraft model of like building out that ecosystem and having that ownership. I used to buy and sell World of Warcraft accounts like as a business uh, back when I was like 16 years old. I had like thousands of dollars going in and out. I got banned one day and then it ended. And then it's like, well, this should probably be legal. Or what if a game was built around this idea? So I think there's a lot of really, really cool stuff you can do. Um, Even in cosmetics alone, I think PAX TF in League of Legends is an incredible example. Um, They gave away like, I don't know, 5,000 of those codes like 10 years ago. And now it's like the most sought after code ever. Uh, in League of Legends. And okay, maybe if we did something that you couldn't accidentally lose in the laundry (laughs) and made it, you know, on chain or whatever as well, then it'd be a lot cooler. So I think there inherently is a really cool aspect of that. Um, Outside the money, I don't want to like sit here, you know, just say it was all money. I I think there is some really cool things you can do with, you know, obviously scarcity and rarity and things like that, that can make things attach. And I think 
talking outside just the funding aspect is the economics of games. Um, I'm not going to sit here and preach to you on that, obviously. Uh, but I think inherently the economics of games, like you read Reddit comments and things like that um, mm-hmm. about games. And you're just like, God, you guys have no idea what running right. a game studio is like. You have absolutely no idea. Like you just want all this shit for free. And like you guys have yeah. no idea what you're absolutely. asking for right here. Um, and so I think inherently the way that I always describe it, because we started as a Web2 game and our whole community was very Web2. And the moment we announced NFTs, everybody freaked out. Like, oh my gosh. And I think the best way that I can put this is like, if having 5% of our cosmetics is NFTs helps us generate enough funds to subsidize you other 90% of players who aren't doing NFTs, isn't that worth it to you? <laughs> like, isn't that yeah. absolutely worth it to you that we can pump out more content? Um, and so I really view it like that. I think there's just like this inherent advantage to like, there are people that want to spend a crap ton of money on games. And uh, I think it was funny enough. I think it was Nico who told me this a while ago, <laughs> like a year ago. He said, Chandler, it is a game design flaw if a player wants to spend a million dollars in your game and they, they can't. can't. Yeah. And I was like, damn, that's actually really interesting and important. And I think like watching Genshin and Star Rail right, right. now. And it's like, thank you, everybody who just spent $100 million in one weekend because I right. haven't spent a dime and I'm enjoying this. So thank you. Um, that's so why I like the concept of spend important. depth, right? Where yeah. you're just like, hey, I want to make sure people can go as deep as they want to go. But like, it, it's hard to do that, right? In a way that like is sustainable. Like if it's like, okay, well, we've got X amount of cosmetics, right? If you buy all those, then, then where do you spend your money after that? So, I mean, that's a question even for this game. Like if I've bought all the cosmetics, how? What? why do I open my wallet after that? Yeah, I mean, I think like... There's not a great answer to this when it's just Sparkball. Obviously, when it's more things than Sparkball, you know, we want to have your own personal little avatar running around that is inf- impacted by what you do in Sparkball. Obviously, that's really cool. Um, but mm, then you introduce the NFT side, and obviously, there's essentially infinite spending on that side. Um, but I think League of Legends has like a, an inherent problem where I think the max amount of money you can spend in League right now is around like nine or ten thousand potentially. Um, And when you go and look at like the average spend of someone in League of Legends, it's like a hundred something dollars. And you're like, if 1% of the League of Legends population could spend a hundred thousand dollars, how much would that average spending per user jump up just to be right right there? Because it's, it's kind of the scale. So I don't have a solution to spend depth. I think that's a great term. I never heard that before, but it's really, really good. Um, And there's not a solution outside of like, hey, some of the cosmetics are NFTs, but I think you inherently want to find really interesting things to do with, you know, live service, constant content, battle passes, um, things that can get people more interesting things outside of content. And I think using the big word AI right now um, is when it comes to live service games like that obviously allows you to turn out content faster. And so... I think it's going to ultimately be a really interesting dilemma for game studios to balance how fast do we release content now that we can, we have a lot of help with it, frankly, um, versus are we just, are are we causing what I call mudflation? Um, This is a term by our old economy director, Daniel Piaz, that I love. Um, It's like, how many cosmetics have to exist in the shop before you're just like, what the fuck? guys? <laughs> like, yeah. this is way too many. Right. Uh, why even own one of these? Because there's, if there's 20 different skins for a single character, then no skin matters. Like, you know, nothing matters anymore. So I think it's balancing those two things and finding interesting ways to, to generate that for sure. Right. And I think obviously people go towards like seasonal rotations and things like that. That's why I found it kind of interesting that Brawl Stars suddenly switched to like uh, shortly after the loot box thing, they switched to now basically having a catalog now where you can buy whatever cosmetics you want for uh, your character. And it's not just limited to like the rotations in the shop now. And, 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 you know, I got to wonder, like, does that have that effect on people where they open up that catalog and they're like, Oh God, where do I start? Versus like the impulse buys that they get from looking at the shop. Totally agree. I think like in any like gotcha or free to play game or whatever, I always go and like find like the monthly bundles of like, here's the the biggest value. Um, but I really just go back to this idea of like, if there's just so many cosmetics, none of them are important to me. Um, and you know, forget about like opening a shop and just being flooded with things. But like, there is like analysis paralysis and like option paralysis where there's just so many things that I can do. I'm just like, forget it. Um, and I think you have to, 
kind of release things on a steady scale. I think League is a little slow, frankly, given their audience and like how fast people consume. Um, but I also don't think like I've seen way too many plans of like, we're using AI to generate cosmetics. And I'm like, be careful. Like if you yeah. go too fast, you're going to screw yourself. Um, right. And it's just going to appear super money grabby. Um, so walking that fine line, I think is incredibly important. So uh, the, the, the other topic that we haven't touched on yet, really esports side of things, right? Like, Obviously, whenever it's a sports style game, like that's an obvious thing, especially when you're a MOBA as well, kind of style. Like, what's your guys' kind of approach or thoughts on the esports side of things? Yeah, I think like this is frankly one of our biggest strengths. And I'll say one thing that in case anybody's never heard it um, never, ever, ever design a game around esports. It is like cardinal sin number one. Everybody in the, in the industry will tell you that. Don't design a game because you want it to be an esport. Make a game and have esports naturally organically say, Hey, this could be a really cool game for esports. Let's do it. Um, so that's definitely the mantra that, that we're following. That said, um, I think we have a lot of advantages for our game. Um, the first one is Omega strikers. Again, I love these people. The game is incredibly well-made. I'm not entirely sure an Omega strikers esports scene is going to take off. Um, and I think it's for the same reason that Madden and FIFA esports scenes don't really take off sports games. Just inherently don't have like that super crunchy depth um, that people really want to dive into esports, like a League of Legends or something like that. Um, because we're a little more combat focused and a little more almost methodical in a way, I think we potentially can can achieve that depth. Um, and the second one is uh, I always reference my wife on this one. I have watched League of Legends esports with my wife, and she just gets up and leaves. She's like, "What the hell is going on?" And she just makes fun of it. She makes like really really funny jokes about like what she sees going on and calls everybody nerds and then walks away. Um, She's watched our games before, and she understands it. It's a ball. <laughs> like, duh. So she can very, very easily follow the ball traveling around and know who's winning. Because in League of Legends, who's winning? Like, how does a, uh, an innocent bystander know who's winning? And so I think we are sporty enough for kind of that mass viewership that, that people really want to go for, where it's like viewed as a sport. But we also have that depth for video gamers, because I think like balancing that, you know, there are esports that people that gamers love watching, but that's it. Like, unless I play this game, I don't want to watch this. I think this is frankly something that's so interesting to me with like Valorant or CS is that I don't play either of those games. I'm not a shooter person. I'll watch those games anytime um, because I understand what's going on and it's super interesting to watch and, and, and I get it. So I think we really filled that gap super, super well. Um, time will tell, I guess. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times it just comes down to dude killed another dude and like, that's exciting. Yeah. Right. And I think that's the most, that or dude kicked the ball into the goal. Like are the, the easiest things to understand? I think so much of like esports too, um, is high and low moments. Um, I think what League does incredibly well, granted, I think it might be too slow for mass adoption, kind of like my wife watching anytime soon. Um, but they have very high highs and very low lows. It's just like there are dead points where you can sit and talk about things. Um, and I think like you think about like football and soccer, like it's kind of the same way. But when you get that high moment, you're like, OK, well, I got to keep watching because what if that happens uh, again? And so I think we've accomplished that really well because you kind of have these moments where it's just like, yeah, people are fighting back and forth. Who cares? The ball is moving around. OK, they're near the goal. Let's start talking about that now. Uh, let's 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 go there. And so right. so much to me of like watching esports is how well, how, how good is it to cast or how good is it to listen to a cast? Um, if I'm listening to uh, a broadcast of League of Legends and not watching videos, yeah, maybe not. If I'm listening to a, a broadcast of Sparkball, OK, maybe. Uh, I hope at least uh, I think <laughs> I'm biased. So kind of everything I say goes out the window on that. But I, I think we we sound good, essentially. Nice. Yeah, I mean, we had that, that issue with uh, Rainbow Six Siege when I was commentating that where, you know, the, it, it goes in rounds and like there's like the, the operator pick time. There's the setup time in the prep phase. There's like kind of the droning phase. You know, there's there's a bit of time before action happens. That's kind of the setup. The plus side was that gives like some space to talk about the strategy, yep. talk about the team, talk about the players, like the more analysis -y kind of stuff. Right. But then like once the action's going, you can't be talking about that stuff. Right. You need. And so it's like I, I find when I see that with like uh, CSGO, for example, it's like that's when you start talking about the econ and stuff when it's slow, like. 
like and the overall team strategy like you kind of go from micro to macro during those moments and then back down once the action starts right um and so like there does need to be a little bit of space Mm -hmm. where there's maybe not something super important happening. But I do also like what so like with a soccer type game, uh, part of the reason I, I, I would have trouble watching actual soccer is like the, the frequency of goal scoring yeah, is so totally low. Agree. Totally. Agree. Uh, I mean, what's it like in your guys' games? Like uh, what's say an average score for an average team in a game? Yeah. I mean, so technically the game winning or the round winning goal can only happen at most three times in one match. Um, but that said, what we found out is that people like scoring. Duh. So what we did is we said, look, scoring the final goal is one thing, but you can also score outside of that. And so like we have a tower and you can throw the ball into the tower and scoring into that feels really good. You can still play defense. You can essentially play a goalie and you, you know, you're juking people and figuring out where you're going to shoot. And that feels almost as good as scoring in the main goal. And then we also added like a mechanic where like the main goal is actually closed and you have to kill the goalie defending it. And one of the ways that you can kill the goalie is by throwing the ball at the barrier behind the goalie, a.k.a. scoring. If the barrier wasn't there, the ball would go in. So we're kind of like simulating that scoring feeling of like, I got the ball past someone in multiple different ways. Um, And that happens 12 to 15 times around. I mean, it's it's constantly happening. And when it's not happening, there's probably some cool kills going on and some cool fights going on. So... I think it works really well where we kind of have the proper amount of down moments because I totally agree. Like I, I'm not actually a soccer fan at all um, for the exact reason you described. And again, attention spans are getting shorter by the minute. Um, and I just don't think, again, if soccer wasn't insanely popular already, with it's the Dota problem uh, type of thing. So who knows? You guys going to add a button where I can fake an injury? <laughs> That's not a bad idea. Stop the game and, and see it. I, honestly, <laughs> it is. Outside of a joke, I think like so much of what we battled against, um, we found ourselves every now and then walking out of a session and like looking at each other and being like, I'm exhausted. (laughs) Like this was, you know, pardon my French, like balls to the wall for 10 straight minutes. There was not a break in sight. I had a 15 minute break, a 15 second break between rounds and that's it. And so a lot of what we've tried to do and part of that goes with adding possession to it was have those moments where you're grouping up and you're starting to set up a play versus constantly trying to make plays. And I think that's what's so interesting. And the part of soccer that's interesting is when you start to see those things come together that leads to a goal. It just doesn't happen often enough. Uh, So, yeah, it really is making sure, like, even in a super high action game, you have to have breaks. have to have breaks. Yeah, for sure. It's, tr- it's tricky, right? Just just not enough to completely break exactly, your, yeah. your source of enthusiasm. You can't let the adrenaline come all the way back down. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, so I guess another question, that I, something we haven't really addressed is, uh, does the map or arena ever matter? Or is it just visual only? Yeah, so right now what we have is what I would describe as ARAM. Um, we figured out that the more that we tried to complicate like the map or the arena, uh, the more we struggled, um, because the iter- the time that you can iterate on changes, it's just much, much harder. Um, it's like you adjust one lever and you got to adjust all these other ones. Um, so we have like a single lane basically, uh, and it doesn't get super complicated. Um, the only thing that really changes on the arena is like I said, the towers and the, the barriers going down and things like that. Um, long term, uh, we kind of need to make a decision and we're largely going to kind of play it by ear on, do we want to stick with this very simple format and just kind of mix each map is still a single lane, but it changes obstacles and changes <clears> things. <throat> or do we want this to be our ARAM? And then we make a summoner's rift um, where, Hey, maybe it's only one round, but there's much more, you know, push and pull and you do this, I do this and type of thing. Um, I don't know yet. Um, but I personally lean toward, I think we're going to keep it pretty simple. Um, I think we've got a really, really interesting core gameplay loop and trying to artificially in a way add strategy around that. Um, What I find in our games right now is the moment that I am not allowed to focus on the ball is a moment I don't enjoy. And so creating chores for our players um, just doesn't feel good. The chores in league would be something like I have to go do this, even though I want to go fight this because I know right. this is mathematically the best play. Um, we're really, really trying to avoid those. And I think that's going to be the delicate balance we have to, to walk with, with future maps. And yeah, one thing I've noticed like personally uh, in playing MOBAs is, uh, if there's no variables that, that are, uh, not, I think that are out of the player's hands, um, 
it can become stale. So, like, uh, just comparing, say, like, uh, League, League of Legends to, like, uh, Pokemon Unite, right? I played Pokemon Unite for a while, but you eventually realize how samey it gets yep. very quickly. Because there's, the map itself provides no real variation to it. Whereas I found, like, you take, like, Elite kind of thing, and some, like, the simplest thing of, like, which dragon kind of thing spawns or whatever, right? Uh, like, which, which thing is available at that time is, like, a small change. But, like, having some variability like that uh, can swing the gameplay enough. And so I feel like there's that, there's that sort of balance where you're like, yeah, you don't want to make this too kooky where I'm, I'm having to like constantly adjust to the map, but that the map adds like a small spice of variety of play so that like the, with the same two teams playing, it doesn't play out so samey. Yeah. I think what makes league like, again, in my opinion, one of the most infinitely replayable <laughs> games ever created um, is Every game feels completely different. It's the champion compositions. It's the way that the level one shook out, and it's the way the first team fight shook out, and and all these different things. Um, and I don't necessarily think it's like just changing the dragon. I think it's just like the positioning is going to be different, right? And the the people on your team are going to be a different you know amounts, and maybe you just hit an item power spike, and that completely changes. The, maybe you're almost level six, and things change. I think what's so key about you know like a, an objective in League of Legends is that chore is not permanent. Um, so one fighting around dragon is and Baron is super fun. It it gets you into team fighting, which is everybody's favorite part of League of Legends. Um, but it's not active one hundred percent. And so what I see a lot of games do that I'm just not a fan of at all. It's like, hey, I was out here having fun, but this jackass just went and did this, and now I got to go fix that. Um, because they wanted to do that, and uh, this happens every now and then with League of Legends with split pushing. I am such a split pusher hater. Uh, it's insane. And there was a season like five years ago where split pushing was the meta. And it's like, I'm having fun. All nine other players in this game are having fun because we're fighting. It's back and forth and it's awesome. And I left the base for 30 seconds. And then this guy over here is ruining my fun because I got to go deal with him now. Um, I think that was the worst meta possible in League of Legends. And I think it happening, you know, once every 50 games, whatever it is, what it is. It's a viable strategy. But we have to make sure that Sparkball doesn't have those moments where it's like, I was having so much fun and this, all seven of us were having so much fun. And this one person doing this, even if it was the right decision, like, look, if that one person made the mathematically chance to make his team win the game, if that is the most mathematically correct decision, we did something wrong. It should not be because it ruins everybody else's experience. So I think that's something just insanely important to focus on. So uh, as we kind of get towards the end here, like I, I, w- I want to find like where are you guys kind of on roadmap? Where is the where's the game at? How can people play it or yep. work towards playing it? That that sort of thing. Yeah, so we're coming up on, um, frankly, like the most important event <laughs> in probably my life. <laughs> like it's kind of crazy. Um, so we have our first ever early access weekend on June thirtieth. Um, you can play uh, by getting a key. Uh, we have a couple sets of NFTs out there. If you don't do NFTs, uh, probably listen, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably do. But even if you don't care about that, um, we have a million different ways to get a key. So I always tell everybody, like, look, if you want to play the game, pay attention and you're going to get one. Like, that's pretty much it. Follow us, be in Discord. You'll, you'll get a key. Um, so we'll unveil our website where you can go put in a code. You'll get a key. And then all you need to do is come back, put that in Steam. You can play on June 30th. Um the next month, we've got so much stuff going on. Uh, we're calling it like Ascension Month, essentially, is kind of our, our branding around this. So we're hosting a tournament on the 24th, um, $30,000. We've got nine of the largest esport organizations in the world. Um, we did really well on courting those. We got really lucky. Um, so it is like the usual suspects that you're thinking it is when I say the largest esport organizations in the world. So, um, that was hugely validating for us, uh, to have those orgs come in. Um, all of them obviously initially said, yeah, we don't really touch web three games. This is not something we're going to do. And we said, come play the game and then give us an answer. And that, that did it for them. So that was hugely validating for us. So really excited to show the competitive side of spark ball on the 24th. Um, I'm just super, I, I kind of wish I was playing, um, but uh, yeah. Are you, so where are you guys broadcasting that? Or, that'll be or, on or, Twitch. Like, how's that gonna go? Yeah, Twitch? that'll be on Twitch. We're about to make the announcement post. We just finished the graphic today. So we're about to make that on June 1st. We'll, we'll kind of share everything. We'll have Twitch drops and everything on there. Um, obviously the teams are going to be putting out a ton of info. Um, a team just confirmed their, the team they're fielding. And it's like, 
like League of Legends nostalgia. It's it's amazing. So super, super excited about that. So yeah, tournament on the 24th. Uh, everybody's going to be able to play, assuming you have a key, on the 30th. Um, and that's really just like our first foray into the public. Um, we've been privately testing the game for, uh, no joke, six years, um, nearly every day. So uh, we've been we're ready for the public to play it. And like, I'm, I'm so excited. Uh, I'm like, unless it backfires and it just like ruins my life. I I don't know. But, uh, just so, so, so excited, uh, for this weekend or for the 30th weekend. And where is, where's game development on the roadmap? Like, are you guys looking to early access? Are you guys looking to do like, Hey, we're going to wait till we have a full kind of 1.0. Like, what does the roadmap look like towards the release of the game? Yeah, That's a good question. So the whole reason we're hosting this early access weekend is metrics. Um, most of the conversations we have with like the really big publishers, um, and the, the really big VCs of the world is like, look, cool game until the community verifies that they also like this game. We're exploring a brand new genre. Like this is not a game type that anyone's really done before. So we need to prove that it works. And so we're hoping to walk away from this early access weekend with proof that it works via numbers. Um, so after that, we're hopefully raise another round and really be able to ramp up development. Um, the stage that I would say we're at is the core loop the core gameplay loop is pretty much done. Um, it's insanely fun. It's really well polished. We don't have a lot of bugs. It just feels good to play. And what we don't have is kind of like that meta loop, account progression, ranked systems, cosmetics, all that stuff. And then of course, content. Um, so in our mind, we have a lot of the easy stuff left, but it is obviously time consuming and, and kind of expanding that pipeline. So like, for example, there's only eight heroes available at early access. We obviously want to be around 20 by the time the game comes out in let's say 12 to 18 months or something like that. So we'll, we'll definitely have some more early access events coming up, but this is, this is the big one. This is kind of the big one that dictates how the rest go for sure. How far ahead are you guys on designing the the heroes that aren't in? We have probably about another seven or eight uh, in the pipeline that, that we have scoped out. I think like uh, our biggest strength, and again, I love playing spark ball. Um, our biggest strength is IP development. Um, we brought in some of the like mainstays from riot um, that, that were responsible for so much of kind of that early universe building. Um, and our characters are just like mind blowingly good. Um, it's usually the first thing people comment about when they come and play our game. So yeah, we have a lot more in scope and frankly, the way that we've designed our universe is like so open ended and fun that when it comes to another character, it can be stuff like, Hey, I was walking around on the street today and I saw this. I think I'd like to make a, a character built on this and we could probably find a way to do it. Um, so yeah, about seven or eight in the pipeline ready to go, but uh, God, I can't wait to do more. Like that's the most fun. I think that's what everybody thinks game design is, is like making heroes and stuff like that. Like everybody yeah. wants to go work at Riot so they can make heroes. And it's like, guys, that's literally like 5% of it. It's, yeah. Have you, fun, have fun spending 90% of your time in spreadsheets yep. and looking at analytics, trying to figure out what you need to change to make this hero yep. not suck. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's it's not all fun in games, uh, but that is the most fun part, hands down. Uh, and I look forward to getting back to it. So, awesome. Well, cool. Well, thanks for for stopping by Always. today. Like, I I just thought it'd be fun to dive into a particular game. I know normally we were, we're talking a little more theoretical or things like that or tech oriented. Obviously, you guys aren't doing a ton in Web three right now, but I'm hoping that you know what you're saying about maybe going forward, doing a bit more with Web three uh, in future stuff, yeah. or maybe even in this game if you decide like there's some good fit for that. And maybe that's something uh, we should talk about as well because I've uh, spoken with other MOBA games. Maybe there's maybe there's some stuff we could do. Um, but either way, like cool stuff and, and definitely uh if people want to go check it out right now uh i believe there's no world or uh sparkball specific website right Correct. there's just the sparkadia one. yeah so we'll be launching the website i think on june 1st it's just about okay. done where you can go put in your keys and everything um the biggest thing i'd say is just go follow us on twitter or join our discord um we announce pretty much everything there and like i said just keep your eyes peeled and you're going to be able to get a key um we also every now and then accept new alpha testers in so if you're interested in coming and trying out the game just pay attention and you might be able to get in early but yeah Twitter, Discord is probably the, the biggest thing to follow us. Um, and yeah, just keep an eye out for all the announcements coming because like we we historically are very, very silent until we're not. Um, and I'm I'm pumped. I'm so pumped. Should people just Google for Sparkadia then to find it? Probably, yeah. Yeah, so like, cause you could give the addresses, but like trying to like yeah, yeah, no, typing no, while they're listening or yeah. something, right? Yeah, if you Google like Sparkadia game or something like that, it'll right. pop up. Uh, anything Sparkadia GG is kind of like the, the handle on everything, um, and, and you'll see us pop up. We've got some YouTube videos out as well, uh, which is probably the best thing I can tell people to do. Um, we're, we love gameplay. Uh, it's like our thing. We, we think everybody has fun playing our game. Uh, so the first thing, if you heard this call and – Shit, we dove really far into game design. So if you've come this far, uh, hopefully, <laughs> uh, go check out what the game actually looks like. 
like uh, we've got a ton of gameplay videos up and you can see kind of everything that we just talked about uh, t- coming to life uh, and, and see what it looks like. Cool. And if people want to get a hold of you, best place to do that? Uh, <laughs> God, the message request on Discord is stacking up yeah, every day. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're generally like really, really transparent. Um, so if you come in Discord and ask questions, we've got really, really helpful mods and community managers and stuff. Um, and anything like specific for me, run it through them uh, because I, I usually – it sounds terrible. I, I remember back in the day, um, you know, you – I'm reaching out and cold calling people. And I remember being like, oh, my God, are these people not responding to me? This is the worst. When I'm in this position and I'm getting cold called, I'm going to respond to everybody. I'm not going to be that jerk. And no, I, I, I'm totally that jerk now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's be patient. Uh, we're obviously swamped for the next month trying to push out everything out for early access. But um, come in. Be a fan of the game. Uh, there are people in our Discord that have been around for all six years. And I truly, truly credit those people for why we're still going. So, even if it's not for us, go be one of those people for another game. Uh, it means everything to developers like us. So that's my that's usually my ending call to action is go be a fan. Be a otherwise, nice fan. otherwise Chandler will cry. Yeah, it's true. It is true. Yeah, everybody needs those super fans. We have a few, and uh, it means it makes a difference. So go be a super fan somewhere. Cool. Well, again, thanks for stopping by. Uh, obviously, uh, we will hopefully have. Uh, you know, different things going on the next couple of weeks because Nico will be out. Uh, for those of you, you know, regular listeners, uh, he's out on a vacation. Uh, so hopefully we can wrangle Phil for the next one uh, and, you know, do some different things in the meantime. But we'll see you guys in the next episode. Thanks for inviting me.